So welcome, my name is Adria Katz. I don't know how many of you guys know this, but we did have a, a gallery show of many of these artists two years ago at the Multicultural Arts Center, um, right during the pandemic, the start of the pandemic. Um, and it was a virtual gallery and we were really thrilled to have all the artists, but there wasn't as much opportunity to connect and we weren't fully on Zoom yet and, and we didn't do all this kind of thing, but we did have one really meaningful um, call where uh, Adriana and Steven and many of the other artists uh, had a chance to share a little bit about what their work was and what the message was behind their work. But we're really excited to have you all back now uh, to go deeper into that conversation and um, uh, think more about what it might look like when we have this group come back again, hopefully in 2024, which is the plan currently. So, um, so thank you all for joining us. Um, I do want to just start with a land acknowledgement. Um, here at the Multicultural Arts Center, we're on the ancestral land uh, and present day land of the Nipmuc and Massachusetts people. And I'm acknowledging also that we're all in a virtual space. And so because of that, I'd like to share a digital land acknowledgement that's written by Adrian, um, Adrian Wong, who's an artist of Spiderweb Collaborative. Uh, since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, Let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technology structures and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet that is not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art we make, we have significant carbon footprints contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous people worldwide. I invite you to join us in acknowledging this as well as our shared role to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in uh, reconciliation, decolonization and allyship. And I think that this call today that we're gonna um, be diving into is really a perfect opportunity to think about our work as art makers um, in the effort to uh, move past uh, colonization, the legacy of colonization, try to think more critically about what our work is doing as it relates to climate and relates to our impact on this world. So I'm excited to be joining you all with for that. So I'd love to introduce Adriana Pratt before we go any further. Many of you know her, uh, but she's the curator of the I3C group of artists and exhibitions. And she's an academically trained scientist with a PhD in biophysics from the University of Buenos Aires. After moving to the USA from Argentina, a more introspective life revealed her call to become a visual artist. Her abstract paintings created on alternative painting supports such as corrugated cardboard and repurposed canvases often evoke maps, islands, or informed by her scientific background, the cells of organisms. Through her work and the work of other artists via her curatorial activities, Adriana's quest is to find a more, to find a way to live a more sustainable life and to inspire change in others to halt climate change. And also joining us today, we have Stephen Rudin, who is uh, one of the artists of this group and also uh, has his own distinguished life and he's gonna be moderating. Um, and I'm getting excited to introduce him as well. So he is a visual artist, a speaker, teacher, and a psychiatrist with degrees from Columbia University, Cornell University, and the Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And he's based in New York City. Stephen uh, Rudin reimagines hand cut paper collage as a metaphor for memory and identity. A blend of precision and whimsy, his multi-layered compositions draw viewers into a dialogue about the dynamic nature of the mind. Based on his expertise in cognitive behavioral therapy, his art philosophy, which he brings uh, to a variety of artistic and educational settings, examines how stories can be put together in many different ways using the same parts. So we have two extraordinary people hosting this event tonight, and we've got a number of artists here with us who are all presenting a little bit about their role in that as well. So I'd love to turn it over now to Adriana and to do something and also share my mm -hmm. screen so that I can back her up. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana, yeah. for the wonderful introduction. And everyone in the Multicultural Arts Center who has been uh, has given us the I3C for Inspiring Change for Climate Crisis Artist Group an opportunity to share tonight, to have our voices heard and our artworks uh, seen. And very importantly, to give a space to build community to help us uh, help the planet. That's really what we are all about it. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, I believe we, we skip it 
Um, yeah, that's welcome. These are the speakers tonight, but if you can go to the next slide, please. Uh, yes. So the mission of the group is to inspire awareness for the human made climate crisis and to inspire change action for the climate crisis through iterations of group exhibits and through meaningful community outreach programming that could be related to the exhibits that we are putting together or even independently of them, such as the panel that we're doing tonight. We started, as you mentioned, Adria, as a group of five passionate friends who uh, put together a show and a proposal that uh, you at the Multicultural Arts Center had during the pandemic. And this original artist group developed into a, a bigger group that I curated, uh, that uh, we had a show at Honey Jones Studio Space uh, or gallery uh, last year. And um, it, it was phenomenal, another Cambridge show uh, that many of you, I believe, uh, had a chance to come. And um, after that, now we are uh, 17 multidisciplinary artists and it's really counting. I mean, I tell you, uh, and we are from Massachusetts, from New York and Pennsylvania currently. Uh, well, we have friends in a number of parts of the world, uh, more to come uh, at some point, but uh, we are 2D and 3D artists and we are diverse in backgrounds uh, and our practices, but we share a passion, a personal and, and artistic commitment to the topic of the climate crisis, as you will see uh, tonight. So in the next slide, uh, you will see the list of the current artists that I said, uh, you know, and, and, and it has a bit of a description of their art practices and their websites. Uh, most of them will be with us tonight. And as the curator of the group uh, and of the exhibits, my vision is that this is an evolving and ongoing project. And my expectation is that we will have more artists as I already indicated. And you can find more information at our uh, website, wwwi 3 c artist.com so in the next one next slide thank you so most of you are very familiar with my work so uh and you can still see it's still on view at the multicultural center until friday uh so without further ado i will give i will pass a mic to our moderator and i three c artist is Stephen been and i'm really looking forward to him setting the stage for the rest of the evening and then to see the work and the presentation of the other uh, artists. Thank you. You're muted, Stephen. Thank you, Adriana. And thank you everybody for coming. I'm so happy to see everybody here. Again, my name is Stephen Rudin. I'm an artist, teacher, and psychiatrist. And I'm interested in emotional resilience and creativity and how art serves as a powerful form of communication, especially it helps us to confront difficult topics. In tonight's uh, presentation, How Do Artists Respond to Climate Change? We're gonna see a diverse selection of 2D and 3D art from 10 artists in the I3C group. And as a special treat, we're gonna hear uh, personally from each of the artists for a few minutes. Back to creativity. Most of us would agree that artists model creativity, but what exactly is creativity and why is it important? So interestingly, you know, I'm a scientist, I'm interested in the science and the psychology of creativity, and there's a growing body of research about, the, uh, about creativity and innovation in fields that span from engineering and medicine to social sciences, and then of course to visual art. And the accepted definition of creativity is that it leads to something new and useful. And that it also can be described as a price as a process that sidesteps habitual ways of thinking, doing, and seeing. So you can see how we want to um, sort of translate creativity to the environment in, in terms of um, sidestepping habitual ways of thinking, doing, and seeing. It's often a dialogue between the maker and the materials. It's often nonlinear. It's steered more by intention than goal. It's guided by intuition and it embraces uncertainty and chance and even looking for the unexpected. Another way of thinking of creative thinking is that it challenges boundaries, imagines new futures, invokes metaphor, reveals the unseen, constructs narrative, and facilitates open-ended thinking. 
But at its core, creativity also helps us to tackle challenges that don't have a set answer. And that I believe that insights discovered through the creative process can be applied to other areas of life. So from back to art, from movement to sound to visual art and beyond, artists transform elements from daily life into works that remind us that sometimes solutions are hidden in plain sight. And in this way, art production encourages us to rethink what is possible, which can be invigorating. Art can also get us to feel something. And I often think that art helps us with concepts that need to be felt in order to be understood. And that emotions can often be the stumbling blocks to understanding something more deeply. Art practices stimulate critical reflection about per personal beliefs and behaviors. And I'm particularly interested in art practices and creativity as a window into our inner wisdom. So now back to the climate crisis. The climate crisis can feel overwhelming and everybody in this group has come here and tried to talk about, talk about climate crisis with somebody outside the group. And we've all noticed that sometimes people shut down and sometimes actually overt hostility when, when discussing the climate. And actually I looked at the literature on climate crisis communication too. I did a big literature review on that. And there's actually, um, a, there's actually people that are looking at understanding why it is that people don't want to engage in the climate crisis discussion. And it really boils down to three different areas. The first area is about mixed messages, is that there's a lot of different sources out there. Sometimes people don't know the difference, for example, between climate uh, change and pollution or ozone layers or microplastics or, or, you know, it's very confusing to people. And also they don't know where there's credible sources. This, this sort of leads to the second area in which the researchers find why, why people have difficulty engaging with climate crisis. And it has to do with the idea that people don't know what they can do and they don't feel that they can do anything. So that's like a double doozy. Number one, they don't know what to make of the information and then they don't know what they can do about it and they don't feel that they can do about it. And then the third one is pretty simple, which is that when you don't know what you can do about it, you don't know that you, you don't feel that you can do anything about it and you don't know what the message is, then it makes you feel uncomfortable. So therefore we see this in our daily life where people shut down. So when people feel uncomfortable about the environmental conversation, they just try to avoid it. So tonight we're gonna to try to change that paradigm. So one of the things that the research shows is that information is not enough, that we have to actually go through the feeling. The feeling is often the stumbling block and that artists have this conduit or this direct access to our feelings so that information is not enough. So lots of scientists are interested in collaborating with artists in terms of the messaging about the climate crisis. So what I'm gonna invite people to do is to turn it on its head and to actually say that even though we don't know what we can do, and even though we're not sure we can do anything about it, even though there's mixed messages, that it actually can feel good to engage in a conversation about the climate. In fact, it feels better to engage in a conversation, even if, especially one about solutions, than avoiding it altogether. So I wanna also leave you before we listen to the artists, which I'm really excited to hear from them with three intentions for tonight's talk. So the first intention would be to facilitate us or to foster a sense of community. We're all here for a reason. And it's a really special opportunity for us to be here because like I said, in our everyday life, we don't get so many people that we can sort of just be like, let's talk about the climate. So we're here, we're all connected and we're here because we feel a sense of community. The second is to highlight the role of creativity in seemingly impossible challenges. And that I believe that just, I sort of think of creative thinking as sort of a cross training for the brain. Remember how I said that it was about sidestepping habitual ways of thinking, seeing and doing that basically that by practicing creativity in any way in life, that it may open up some realizations in areas that are not necessarily directly related to what you're being creative about. And then the third one is to inspire communication about the climate crisis through art, that it's not just about the information, but that it's also about our feelings. So without further ado, let's hear from the artists. Thank you, thank you. That was fantastic. All right, I'm gonna share my screen again and then we'll bring on the artist to, to speak. And here's a, just a bit about Stephen's art as well if you wanna learn more about his work. All right, Sarah. Hi, um, I'm Sarah Brent and this is my piece, Hot Mama. Um, I have been working with um, assembled materials, mostly originally from my house, um, but 
then I was sort of was running out of stuff and my kids didn't like seeing their things in my art and in, in the art. So a lot of this is like donations from friends and the community. And I like to take it and sort of assemble it in like a geometric way or sort of take all this stuff and make something that I think is really beautiful. Um, I am really excited about joining this group because I'm trying to figure out more sort of what we're talking about, how art can, I can use my art to sort of get a message out about climate action. Um, personally, I'm involved in a group called Mothers Out Front in my town, and they have this awesome transfer swap shed um, where you can drop things off and pick them up, and I'm, I've been volunteering there, um, which is, which has been great for me for getting different materials and um, but I'm really excited about sort of combining these two parts of my life and figuring out more about how to use art for change. Um, and I'm based in Waltham, Massachusetts. Was that everything I'm supposed to talk about? Yeah. Thank you, Sarah. Martha is next. Hi. <laughs> Um, thanks for inviting me to speak about my work tonight. Um, I'm really honored to be part of this group, the I3C group of artists who inspire thoughtful discussion, exchange of ideas and plans for action. I've always been a passionate recycler, even at college in the early 70s when a uh, few of us realized why it was so important. And beginning with my career as a costume designer and now as a um, independent artist, I've always repurposed various garments and materials to create my artwork. Uh, this is tarp dress, and um, it will be at the Art House Gallery in Austin this summer with the I3C group. Uh, it, was exhibit, it was exhibited only one other time in 2019 with the Cambridge Art Association, uh, receiving a Spotlight Award, a curator's recognition at the Mary Shane Fall Salon. Um, it's made out of a used woven painter's drop cloth. It's woven plastic that was stained and torn and frayed. I did not add any paint or fray any pieces of the tarp. I just cut and pinned to put it together and put it together as, as, what, as was uh, found. Um, it's uh, put together with corsage pins. I intended to sew it originally, but I decided to keep the pins. Um, my dress sculptures and wall hangings use all kinds of materials. I've made dresses out of patio umbrella canvas, used mailing envelopes, citrus bags from the supermarket, and um, even coat linings. Um, and the work speaks to repurposing and reusing. And I think it speaks to um, seeing um, beauty in used and somewhat um, frayed materials. Thanks. Thank you, Martha. Maria Celeste is next. Hi, hello. Uh, my name is Maria Celeste. I go by Celeste. Um, I, I create, well, in my work, as you can see there, I create uh, imaginary landscapes with uh, symbolic objects to represent different topics or concepts that I would like to uh, that interests me, always with the intention to show the connection between nature and humankind. Um, I had the opportunity as a child to travel uh, through uh, Argentina and seeing all the diverse landscapes um, that you can find from the north to the south, east, west. And uh, I'm trying to kind of express all that experience, all those emotions of, for example, being in the, in the middle of um, South Plateau and uh, feeling that is um, um, overwhelming landscape that is never ending at the time it seems. And, um, and you had the realization that you are connected with, with, uh, with nature and you are one with nature. And um, so it's uh, hard to think on the ownership of the land at that point. So, um, so it's, that is right. This is what I try to, uh, or intend to represent in my landscapes as, as you can see in my work. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. And CJ is next. Hi, I'm CJ. I'm in Brookline, Massachusetts. 
Um, I used to do some work with found materials, but as time has gone on and space has shrunk, I tend to more traditional, like oil on canvas. Um, way back on a trip to France in 2005, I was inspired by the agricultural countryside to paint a landscape with the trees flying away. I was thinking about the threat we have become to our natural environment and re remembering Rene Magritte's floating men in bowler hats. I had always anthropomorphized elements of landscape in my work, tree branches as arms, bark as skin, even blades of grass as fingers. So it seemed a logical step to transform Magritte's businessmen into trees. Usually when I had worked in series, I did between five and 10 paintings in each series. In this, what I call the trees leaving series, I've done over a hundred paintings. There seems to be a myriad of scenes to explore and their meaning has grown to encompass themes of loss, liberation, and the yearning to escape. This piece that you see, Autumn Passing, was completed in the fall of 2020. It's a 22 by 20 inch oil painting of a section of Halls Pond Sanctuary in Brookline, very close to where I live, caught in mid-departure. In that year, I added a new painting for each season to the Trees Leaving series, but in these, there is a whole chunk of land flying away rather than just individual trees. I think my focus was more toward issues of isolation and community during that time. And like so many others, I was spending more of that time outdoors. One of the few positive developments to come out of this pandemic was that so many people found refuge in the woods and wildlife reservations. It was an opportunity to connect or reconnect with nature. Heightening that connection between human beings and the natural world is a central aim of my work to increase, increase appreciation and respect for the complex ecosystems that surround us and to recognize our common essence. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. Wonderful. And Rebecca is going to be next. Hello, everybody. I'm Rebecca McGee Tuck. And I'm a found object fiber sculptor. I work predominantly with marine debris, uh, like rope and fishing line. But I also use uh, work with single use plastics and plastic packaging and retired clothing and textiles. Um, this piece right here that you see is called Regarding Coral. And I was inspired to make it after watching a documentary on um, on Netflix about uh, called Chasing Coral about the decline of the, the coral reefs. And it um, inspired me to start creating art in a way that would um, use the very materials that I was collecting along the rack line of the beaches uh, in a way that would, would um, I was trying to create something beautiful with the garbage but also represent um, what, what I was thinking about while making it. I, I hope that makes sense. Uh, anyway, I, I always have used found materials in my art, but when I began collecting sea debris at the rack line of the coast of Massachusetts, uh, it became um, increasingly um, more obvious that there was, there was problems um, and, and just an overwhelming amount of trash uh, to be had. Every time I went, I would, collect pounds and pounds of it. And um, it made me, it, it made me uh, want to change what ways that I was working and change things that I was doing in my life. And um, I guess through my art, I'm hoping to inspire change in other people, whether it's small ways or in big ways. Um, I've joined groups uh, such as Surf Rider Foundation and um, that actively cleans up the oceans and the coast of Massachusetts. I've, um, I, I've just took many steps now to, to become somebody who is going to, um, uh, I guess, help inspire change for uh, the environment. And um, I hope 
and I know we're in the right place to do that. So thank you very much. Thanks, Rebecca. I'm excited to hear everyone's suggestions on that front as well. All right, Michael, but. Oh, hey, uh, that's me. Um, yeah, this is inspiring. Um, just hearing you all and seeing your work like this is really exciting uh, for me. So kind of yes to all of you, and all of that. Um, my story, I guess, just briefly begins in the fall of 2009. Um, I decided to sell my car and begin the process of raising my kids, working and living my life car free. And at the time I was a single dad, my kids were nine, 13 and 15 and they were fully involved in school. Did you lose me? No, you're still there. Okay, great. Uh, and uh, school sports orchestras. I can remember uh, on Saturdays uh, riding bikes into the New England Conservatory with my son and his cello, you know, on my back. Um, at the time I was a freelance photographer with clients, you know, kind of all over New England. And um, I had a bike that was set up, you know, to carry equipment, uh, carried my suit if I had a formal type of assignment. Um, so it was really, it was a challenge um, that when I started, I had no idea it would last for 12 years um, being car free in the city in Cambridge, Cambridge in summer. And um, so except for some instances over that time uh, that, you know, the, those 12 years, I managed to kind of do everything I needed to do by bike and by public transportation. Um, and this work, it evolved during that time uh, as a way for me to explore uh, areas of critical uh, concern uh, like watersheds, marshes, coastal areas, uh, forests, uh, mostly so far in New England. Um, and uh, also all of the images in this body of work were made you know, by bicycle, on bicycle and, and on foot. Um, and they're meant to, you know, I want them to stand on their own uh, as images uh, and celebrate the beauty of the environments, but I'm hopeful that they also maybe will raise awareness um, of the fragility of these environments and the importance of these places in, you know, global warming and climate change. Um, I also do some painting and mixed media work and I, I, I use recycled materials and, and found objects in that pretty much as much as possible. Um, you know, reuse, rework and upcycling have always been really important to me. And this, as a just kind of side note, my youngest son who I used to ride into uh, orchestra with, he's an artist now in his own right. Um, and his fashion design and his clothing are all rooted in these same, you know, these same principles of rework and recycle and upcycle. So it's kind of exciting to see him you know, exploring these, these same self. Excellent, thank you, Michael. Maybe he'll be the next I3C participant. <laughs> hey. All right, Shelby, that. Yeah, hi. Um, thanks to Adria and Adriana for bringing us together tonight. And I've loved hearing what everyone has been saying because so much of it resonates with what I feel, what motivates me as well. Um, so I'm Shelby Meyerhoff. I'm a multidisciplinary artist, which means my work incorporates um, painting and photography and embodiment. And this is an image from my zoomorphic series in which I transform myself into animals and, and other creatures inspired by the natural world. And I loved what Stephen said about how creativity helps to break down boundaries because that's so much um, a part of what interests me is the sort of false boundaries that um, our society often sets up between human beings and other living things. And, um, and this question of how, when we confront the crisis that we're facing, it's not just an intellectual grappling, it's really an emotional um, coming to terms. I think that is something that shapes my own work, that there's this real sense of um, the beauty and wonder of the natural world and recognizing our place within it. And you know, to CJ's point about being um, really present in the natural world. And I know for a number of people here tonight that wherever 
um, is your special place or your home, there's this sense of just oh, taking a walk there, finding your materials there, however it is that um, we're present to that is really uh, sustaining. And yet at the same time, you know, for me, I mean, I think for many artists now, it's almost impossible to go out into that same world in those meaningful places and not feel a deep sense of tension and disquiet about what's happening. And um, so the question of what each of us is called to do individually and collectively to address that. So um, yeah, I really, I, I really appreciate this group and um, the work that everybody is doing. And every time we gather, I get new um, sustenance and also um, to some extent accountability too, that every time we get together, I think, what well, am I, what more could I be doing? What haven't I thought about? Um, so I particularly owe Adriana a real thank you because every time that I get a, um, a message from her, <laughs> it makes me think again about um, these questions because it's never really a settled, a settled answer. So um, yeah, thanks. Thanks for us being together tonight. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you. All of yeah, you. We, we all need the people to keep us accountable and keep us in check. All right, uh, Carol is up. Hi, my name is Carol Moses. I live in Cambridge. Um, I, I'm a 2D artist. I do a lot of painting and I also do photography, but um, the piece that's included here is a collage of photographs of lichen. This, these pieces were collected by me after a storm in Maine. The place I was, there are a lot of old trees with tons of lichen on them. And I was out walking on the grass after the rain. And I was just blown away by the stunning nature of all these little pieces. And I gathered them up still damp and brought them in the house and photographed each one on a little piece of brown paper. And then I put them together in this group so I have three pieces that I've done for this particular I3C. Two of them are what we need, why we're doing this, what we need to preserve, and how these things need to keep breathing in the world. And they need the air to be clean. And they need the rain to be clean. I have another piece that is um, composed of a collage of little animals and plants in wetlands. And then I have a third piece, which is sort of nasty, which is a collage of images of pollutants in the gutter, garbage and plastic and nasty things that people have discarded. So I think that my connection with caring about the climate crisis is the preservation of the natural world I was a child who loved bugs and grew up in a gardening family. And as I got older and read more, I came to understand the, the place of native materials in the world, that um, native plants, there's a great book called Bringing Nature Home, which I've bought any number of times and given to people. It's so amazing. Everybody should buy it bringing nature home. And in there it says, people say, what does bird, what does bird food look like? And there's a picture of a caterpillar. And basically we need to have native plants growing in all areas and they sustain insects and the insects sustain bird life. And also those plants attract and support pollinators, which all of our food crops depend on. So um, I think that's my biggest connection is caring about the flora and fauna that we live with and of which we are one. Um, so I guess this image is, is basically to inspire us about the beauty that 
has been created in the world and why we should care to preserve it. And I think what I do maybe that's useful besides individually, personally planting tons and tons of native shrubs and perennials and, and trees is to proselytize and try to share that information with other people and post on neighborhood things to try to educate people about it. So that's, I think that's it for me. Thank you, Carol. And I, I did write your name, the name of the book. You suggest in the chat. I'm going to try to do that as we share resources. Um, I'm sorry if I've missed any so far, but uh, I think it'll be a nice place to have resources for other people to reflect on after. All right, Carol, uh, after you is Jeffrey. One before, one slide before. I'm sorry. Yeah, Paula. No, thank you. Oh. No, no, Jeffrey. Jeffrey first. Jeffrey. Yes. There you are, Jeffrey. <laughs> thank you. Sorry about that. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Jeffrey, and I'm coming from uh, Lower Alston in Boston. Um, I'm really, really uh, happy to be here. It's been such a pleasure working with this group and seeing it evolve and grow um, and that we can uh, bring in more people to this conversation because I know it's so critical. Um, I, I hope that the work that I do functions in two ways. One, um, to show how uh, you can use all sorts of reclaimed material um, to create work. Um, and to that, it is a woven piece. And so the idea that weaving um, these materials together uh, demonstrates how so many things in our lives are interconnected. So um, I, you know, echoing a lot of the folks in this group came from a background where I appreciated being outdoors, appreciated nature, um, and appreciated other living beings in in a way that would uh, de-hierarchize or uh, change that hierarchy and importance. Um, and so I am working with a lot of these reclaimed materials and weaving them together in order to show that um, there's such an abundance of this, you know, uh, what we call trash or refuse and that it can be changed and it can, um, you know, act as something beautiful, but also act as a, um, a kind of information about how much we're using and consuming. Um, I'm an educator and so, uh, I tried to emphasize how much of these found materials um, we can employ to make our artwork um, and that there is no hierarchy in material. Um, I'm also working at a grocery store, so I see the behind the scenes and this, uh, again, this a mass of um, plastic materials for our food and seeing that um, this you know, sort of goes through and, and you throw it away. And so I'm collecting, collecting and showing again that there's this interconnectivity with our um, our models of consumption and consumerism um, and, our, and our ways and dealing or not dealing with waste. Um, so that's hopefully what's coming through in this work. And um, I'm just here again, learning more and more about ways in which we can engage with this um, this really critical issue. Thank you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Okay, Paula. Paula, if you're in the room, um, please. I think we will, yeah. yeah. That's the work of Paula, it's beautiful. Okay. And um, we will go to Luna. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Luna. Hi, hi everybody. Uh, I'm sorry, I have a little bit of a host voice because I had a um, laryngitis, but I try the best I can. It's great to be here with you all. 
And I think it's so important to educate um, uh, also, especially children and youth and their families, um, not only uh, through art um, as a, a piece of a creative activity, but also to go out into the wetlands, into um, the outdoors and experience nature um, close up. Um, so I also work with children in Guatemala at an inner city school in uh, Guatemala City. And it was quite kind of amazing how these children uh, had a connection with nature. And not only, um, you know, the um, uh, being in, in outdoors and touching uh, plants and uh, immersing themselves in that environment, uh, but also the knowledge that stems from oral history, from Mayan culture, and um, so to uh, propel to other uh, areas such as the United States uh, and also some European countries, like I remember France, there are piles of plastic changed a little bit, but still, uh, here, I was just thinking uh, when I uh, rolled the garbage pen down um, at the curbside and uh, we try to recycle a lot. We um, have some own produce in our garden. We go to farmers markets, but still there is too much plastic. And when I think about the turtles getting caught in nets of plastic and all that, there are uh, islands just consisting of plastic, it makes my heart ache. And I think this is so important what we are doing here and bring to the awareness. I recently also talked with a friend of mine who is in Costa Rica and uh, started a project on uh, the redwood trees that I would like to introduce you to at one point in time. It's called Luna Grove, <laughs> mm. interestingly enough, but it's a really fascinating uh, project. And um, yeah, so my this one painting actually illustrates that how we are uprooted, but are at the same time, uh, there is this vital um, um, blood um, canal that uh, is nutritious and still connected with the inner of the earth. So I'm very much uh, in, into um, nature and earth um, sciences and have been meditating throughout my life. And uh, so among trees, and so trees mm -hmm. are very important to me. And thank you very much, all of you, for doing your amazing work and for being here today. Thank you, Luna. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that Paula just joined us. So Paula, if you can, uh, yeah. if you'd like, uh, we'd love for you to oops, uh, talk a bit about your work if you are able. <clears throat> okay, I think, I think, are you with us, Paula? I don't. I don't think Paula is here. So we will just... go back. Yeah, I don't think that. Unfortunately, Paula mm -hmm. and a few others that I will show there yeah. are very quickly. So we go back to Luna right. and then one more. Thank yep. you. So yeah, unfortunately, we have not the presence of Cedric and Miguel, Michel Lugi, Cedric Harper, and then the other uh, slide, please. Um, Cynthia Staples and Steve uh, Stephen uh, um, Bennett. They are not here, but uh, I'm sure they will be in future uh, talks and for sure they will be in future presentations, uh, exhibits that we will do. So that's it for the artists. Uh, uh, Paula is here now. So much. Yeah. Oh, Paula is there. Oh, oh sorry. Yeah, I just yeah. had a little audio, I just had a little visual problem. I, I apologize. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for including me on this uh, climate crisis talk about our artwork. Uh, my paintings are a take on the uh, climate crisis is looking at the world from wild animals point of view in context with the urban environment. This painting 
is part of a series on the seasons at a, computer, uh, at a commuter train bridge located in a cul-de-sac in my neighborhood. The title of this painting is November Splendor, Deer Running, Commuter Train, Taggers and Milkweed Airborne. Near my home, past the parcel land and manicured lawns, the land opens up to nature, wildflowers, trees, and wild animals. With a highway nearby and the train tracks, one could construe the area as a wasteland. However, this small wild space is a haven for flora and fauna to exist. In my painting, the deer are running in opposite directions to the train's movement. I suggest the deer and the train run in the same direction. As if we all have the same goals in mind, coexistence and survival of all of our species. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paula. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you so much. So before we go to the open, uh, no, uh, sorry. One before, uh, before we go back to Stephen and, <laughs> um, and to the open discussion, I want to say how uh, it, it was amazing. I'm, I'm, I, I don't have words, so I will not <laughs> use them. You are all amazing. Uh, the art, beautiful people above all. And um, thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for trusting the group and our mission. So, so yeah, that was e extremely inspiring and consistent with sort of the uh, the intention and in the uh, of the group. And I'm really uh, hopefully everybody understands why we formed as a group and why we invited you all. And so also part of our mission is that like Adriana and I have talked about the butterfly effect that you know that if a butterfly flaps its wings, you know, in some part of the world that it leads it to a tidal wave somewhere else. But the idea notwithstanding the metaphor there but the the, the idea here is that they, that that we could, could you know have a ripple effect and that hopefully that you know that by showing that we are actually engaging with the environment are engaging with the discussion that we're inspiring you to think about ways in which you're engaging with the environment so we were thinking that perhaps we would break off into small groups just for a few minutes for people to have an opportunity to speak on a smaller um in a smaller group and to just talk about what was impactful about the work. And then also just to have the opportunity to talk about things that they've been doing or that you all have been doing or that you all would like to do and you'd like basically for, um, you know, to share with a group of people that are, again, receptive audience because unfortunately for better or worse, it's rare to have that. So we're also gonna have, so the small groups are gonna have one, um, at least probably two artists, but one of the artists is gonna be a scribe to write down the ideas of what comes up in the group. We're gonna do that for about, let's say six minutes, then we're gonna come back and we're gonna just wrap up. So Adria, uh, I think you've already pre-sorted the groups and uh, hopefully without much complication, we're just gonna break off and then we'll come back in. Yep, I think we're ready to go. So we'll, we'll be in these groups for about seven minutes, understanding that we may go a little bit over um, our yeah. time allotment for tonight, which is fine. If you're willing to stay, please, please do afterwards for a short conclusion. All right. Well, hopefully we'll... people will want to stay. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> See you in seven to 10 minutes. <laughs> but is everybody back? Yes, so I think um, I would love to invite you all to drop in the chat uh, any of your notes from your meeting. And um, CJ, I'm gonna just make sure that all of your notes go to everyone because they came to me directly. And Adriana, why don't you uh, tell us a little uh, bit about I3C? Well, the, 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 what I was saying before is that uh, you have to go <laughs> to the page to find more news and, and you will know more about the next exhibits. I mean, the one that is coming up in July is at the Art House Gallery. So a lot of events are being planned and a lot in, in several places. So it's very exciting. And uh, in the next slide, perhaps, um, that will be my last one. Uh, we might use some of the climate crisis solutions that transpired from tonight's presentations or, or at least exchanges. And um, we might use them to populate our ideas for change and solution um, page. And we might use that for future newsletters and uh, please sign up for the newsletter. And 
although Michelle Lugi was not here, I wanted to highlight that she's very embedded. I mean, she actually um, created with Cecil Miller, the curator, uh, the plastic tapestry project that is very exciting. And the artwork that was inspired, that inspired this project, that is basically a community project of working with repurposed materials, plastic, uh, is going to, it, it, the, the, the piece that inspired was Flotsam that hopefully will be uh, shown at our house gallery for our I3C show. And um, also um, it happens, it's taking place very close to my home. But um, anyway, that is, you have all the information there. Uh, Stephen, back to you. Well, thank you everybody uh, for coming. If this was very inspiring for all of us, I think. Um, if anybody wants to talk to the group in general about anything they want that they're taking away from this talk, we invite you to do that now. We know we're over, but if anybody wants, and uh, Luna, you're raising your hand. So Luna, if you want to say something, but if any, we're just leaving it open for the last couple of minutes in case anybody wants to say any final thoughts. And also feel free to put them in the chat because we're gonna look at the chat over time. Luna. Yeah, just a, a quick comment. What I mentioned about Luna Grove, could we add, possibly add this to the art support uh, uh, page? I have a really nice video also, Adriana. Can you put that in the chat, Luna? Just type um, it in the chat. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sh sure if I have. You know, I have my computer and my iPad. I but I will put it. Let me see. So I go. Luna, to, I think I I added it earlier. You did as you were mentioning about it. Yep. Great. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you, Luna. Thank you. Thank you all so very much. And I'm sorry for my voice. It's okay. <laughs> Your voice is perfect. So, so if not, I don't know, we run out, uh, we, we are a bit over, but if, again, if somebody else wants to, to add something, otherwise, um, it was such a, such a feast to be with all of you today. I don't know if this is a word that applies to, <laughs> to something that is not edible, sorry. Uh, but uh, it was <laughs> amazing. It was amazing to um, to confirm that um, the artists in this group are super committed with this cause, and that uh, people are so uh, open to to the change and to act for change. And Adria, thank you so much for your kindness to open, you know, your space. Uh, although we will be back in 2024 and we were in 2020, uh, thank you for opening and giving us uh, this, uh, this space, this safe space. And thank yeah. you, Steve, <laughs> Stephen, for amazing moderating. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I think we'll give the, the scribes just a couple more minutes in case they want to put their yes, yes. in the chat. But everybody else. Hopefully we'll see you at future events. There's a lot of other programming that this group plans on doing. So please, you know, stay in touch with us and let us know what you liked and what you would like to see more of. Yes, it was a pleasure to meet you all. Stay in touch and um, we'll have, see the I3C back here soon. And in the meantime, please come on by to see Adriana's show and the next show is on Young Cuba and you can learn more about us online as well. Yeah, okay, let's, keep on, let's keep up the support to the Multicultural Arts Center. We need you. Thank you.